Australian Grand Prix, Michael Schumacher wins the Brazilian Grand Prix, Michael Schumacher wins yet again. Michael Schumacher claims Ferrari's 150th Grand Prix victory. He's a five times World Formula One champion. Michael Schumacher and Ferrari, big winners, occasionally Champagne Charlies, entering a new season that follows a winter of massive change. Hello there. It's all systems go in Australia next weekend as Formula One gets to grip with a new set of regulations all imposed since the last Grand Prix in Japan back in October. Now, if you're not sure what's happened, you will find out right here over the next hour. Martin Brundle is with me. Well, Martin, F1 2003, virtually a whole new ball game. Yeah, it's a wild time in Formula One at the moment. Never have there been so many changes so quickly. Some of them are good. I'm very happy about the new qualifying single lap effort on Friday afternoon and Saturday afternoon. That's going to be very exciting. Some things I'm not so pleased about. The fans are going to see less track action over a Grand Prix weekend, particularly as there's no warm-up on the Sunday morning of the Grand Prix, so they won't see or hear a Grand Prix car until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The teams have far less time to work on the cars, and surely that is going to have an impact on safety and reliability. The FIA have forced these changes through quite quickly and they've had a few U-turns and they've diluted them a bit. There is some confusion out there, but there's one thing for sure, Jim, Melbourne is going to be very fascinating. Delighted to be going to get in the views as well of uh, David Richards, the team boss at uh, British American Racing, of David Coulthard, Britain's top driver, Mike Gascoigne, Renault's technical director, and Alan McNish. And Alan with a vital testing role at Renault as well. Welcome to you all. Well, Jensen Button, a swap Renault for BAR. We explore his relationship with his new teammate, Jack Villeneuve. We welcome Ralph Furman to the grid. The farmer's boy from Norfolk will be ploughing F1 furrows for Jordan. Justin Wilson makes it four British drivers this season. Minardi have found room for him. And we've been winter testing with the big three, with Ferrari, with Williams and with McLaren. But we start with those new regulations. The overall aims are to cut costs and improve the show. Max Mosley, the president of the FIA, the governing body, is absolutely convinced these changes had to happen. Well, it was clearly necessary to do something. The, uh, a lot of the racing had become very boring. And also the way in which the cars are being operated were putting too much emphasis on the machine and not enough on the man and something needed to be done. And we tried to get the teams to agree to various changes, then we let them sit down on their own, talk about changes. Nothing came out of that, so in the end, we felt we had to act. So explain to us the changes in testing, in particular, the Friday sessions around a Grand Prix. Private testing is massively expensive. They run a parallel team. So we wanted to give the smaller teams the opportunity to go testing without running a parallel team. Obviously, the time is more restricted, but they have the advantage that they're testing on the circuit where they're going to race, which in almost every other case, the teams with the full test programs can't do. It's interesting to see whether it works. You've changed the qualifying hour. Just tell us about that. Well, that, that's going to be quite interesting because, in essence, what's happening is on Friday, there is a qualifying session for the first time for many years. It's a single lap qualifying, so they've got one lap to get the job done. The person who's leading the championship has to go out first when everything being equal the track will be at its slowest and the uh, person at the back of the championship goes out last. Whoever is fastest in that session gets to run last in the Saturday session which again is one lap but this time it's for the grid. Now after qualifying you're going to lock the cars away until just before the race itself. Why are you doing that? we started hearing that the top teams were going to build special qualifying cars. 
and cars with engines set to do just 12 kilometers, amazingly light chassis, running with no radiators at all. In fact, cars that were quite different to the race car. Now, that's undesirable for a number of reasons, but the main one being that it's phenomenally expensive. We looked into how we could best stop that. The team suggested stopping them changing the engines and one or two major components, but that we realized quite quickly wouldn't go far enough. So in the end, we exercised our right, or we are going to exercise our right, to put them in Parc Ferme. So the car that finishes qualifying has got to be the same car in all respects as the car that starts the race. Now, originally, you wanted to ban pit-to-car radio communications, but you've softened your stance a bit, haven't you? There were two things we wanted to do. We wanted to stop all the telemetry, these huge aerials you see in the paddock, where they were sending technical data out to the computers on the car and getting technical data back. And we also, at the same time, said we want to stop the radio. The main reason for stopping the radio, talking with the driver, was with a digital radio, it's possible to conceal a signal and to do things that we didn't want done with the telemetry. In the end, they said, well, look, can we keep the radio if we can make it stand alone so that it is impossible to send signals into the car's computer via the... And we said, well, that's perfectly reasonable. We don't actually mind them talking to the driver. It's fixing the car while it's running we don't like. Now, traction and launch control will be there in Melbourne, but it disappears for the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Why has that happened? To have the technology for knowing what's going on inside the engine perfected was going to take a certain amount of time and therefore we gave a delay until Silverstone. We want, when we do impose the ban, everybody to know there's just no question, there is no traction control. And With all those backups then I think we'll have it. Now you've altered the point scoring as well for every Grand Prix. What's your thinking behind that? When the original six place system uh, was introduced, Quite often, only six or seven cars would finish the race. Now we've got much higher standards, more reliability, and people like Minardi or Arrows last year were regularly finishing those positions but not getting points. It seemed fairer to extend that. And at the same time, it narrowed down the gap between first and second, which again, the teams felt, and there's, there are arguments on both sides, but the teams felt that that reflected more the achievement of getting a second place, which is still a massive achievement. Well, he's shaken the sport up OK, but two high-profile team bosses have, have not only objected to those new regulations, they've gone to the sports arbitration process saying Formula One is going to be dumbed down and more dangerous as well. Well, let's hear from McLaren's Ron Dennis and first Sir Frank Williams. We consider that the Concord Agreement, which is a tripartite contract, a legal document, has been sidestepped deliberately by Mr Mosley, the president of the FIA, in order to unilaterally impose upon us sporting and technical changes that are not properly observing due pro process in that contract. Formula One is the pinnacle of motorsport. It always has been and always should be. And effectively these regulations are going to see the cars carry less, less levels of sophistication than some of the other lesser categories. I mean it's just um, not the way to go. The manufacturers who participate in Grand Prix racing need the challenge, need the ability to demonstrate superior technology to justify their investment. There are approximately 10 manu car manufacturing groups in the world. Seven are active in Formula One, owning their own teams or partnering other teams. You can't say goodbye to those gentlemen. Formula One arguably would, be, would collapse. We need to have technology, we need to have plans that are affordable, but also embrace the manufacturers as well as the teams. There you have it then, Williams and McLaren, very much in the opposite corner to Max Mosley and the FIA. We have a wide range of opinions here in the studio as well. Be sure to rejoin us to debate the F1 upheaval. Here we are then looking ahead to the new Formula One season. We've heard about the new rules and the opposition as well from Williams and McLaren. Let me just remind you of the main changes for 2003. 
So testing restrictions, uh, two qualifying sessions, uh, one hit wonders really those, reduced the engineering access to the cars, they're locked away between qualifying and the race itself. You've got to start the race with the same amount of fuel in your car as you had in qualifying, that'll be tricky. Changes to communications between the car and the pits, electronic aids to be phased out, no launch control at Silverstone this year and changes to the scoring system as well. So then Martin, uh, improvements or a step back in time, what do you think? I think generally improvements. I think everybody agrees that there needed to be some change. Technology and showbiz has got a bit out of kilter, I think, and the fans can't get their juices flowing, uh, thinking about 50 software engineers halfway around the world doing a good job. But it's going to change the way Grand Prix teams go racing, and I'm fascinated, I think, to hear what the panel think, mm. uh, how it affects their particular discipline within the sport. David Richards, Max Mosley said he had to do it because you, the team bosses, couldn't sort it out yourselves. Well, uh, you know, to a certain extent he is right. We were given the opportunity to resolve things. We did come up with a raft of, of changes, but the opinion of, of Max is it wasn't enough. And, you know, he's, uh, uh, that's probably a valid opinion to a certain extent. And he came in with a, a, an interpretation of the regulations that take it a, a significant step uh, in, uh, in the direction it's taken now. Mm. David Coulthard, how much will this change your race weekend? Quite dramatically, I would imagine. Well, obviously, the, the format for the weekend changes significantly, but the bottom line for drivers <coughs> is that you still have the same, same goal. You have to drive that car quickly, whether it be with 9 kilograms of fuel in qualifying or whether it be with 80 kilograms of fuel. So the, the, the biggest change is going to be in how the, the engineers and the teams interpret the new rules to, to get the strategy right for the race weekend. How about the one-hit qualifying session? Well, we had four one hits before. You know, I never took the attitude of, oh, I've got this is my warm-up qualifying run, and then I've got my second warm-up, and you know, working for a crescendo at the at the end. It's you've always got to think that your your qualifying run could have been your last. Could oil could have gone down, or the weather could change. So again, I don't really feel that that ultimately changes anything, other than if you do make a mistake on that run, then of course you don't have anything to back it up. Mike, do you, as a technical man, feel a bit handcuffed by these new regulations? I mean, not handcuffed, and I mean, don't forget, there haven't actually been any changes to the technical regulations, although there are some changes for safety. Um, it's the interpretation of the sporting regulations. It does limit the work we can do on the car, especially pre-race, which is an issue for us. Um, but also as a team, we have to make strategy decisions much, much earlier, and that's going to be something that's very, very interesting. But you had to work sometimes throughout the night before a Grand Prix. You're not going to be able to do that now. No, I mean, we, we can't work on the cars uh, for the side. I'm sure the mechanics will uh, appreciate that. But um, against that, I think we'll be sitting up late into the night deciding on the strategy that we've actually already committed to, whether we've got it right and what we can do about it. And Alan, your, your Friday testing role is going to be absolutely crucial, isn't it? Well, it certainly is from a few points of view. One, that we do have restricted testing through the year. And so therefore we have to get everything 100% right on Friday morning to make sure that the decision by Renault to do that works. And so it's going to be very exciting in the first few races to make sure we do get it right. I think Ron Dennis called you track cleaners, didn't he, on a Friday? Well, hopefully we're going to be track cleaning in front of him on the Sunday. That's the intention. Mike, you've got a very concentrated period of time you're now allowed to work on the cars. Surely if it's a cost-saving basis, you're going to have to take more people now that can really focus in in those two and a half hours to do all the work you would have done in the 18 hours before that uh, in the normal Grand Prix circumstances. Is that not going to affect uh, safety? And also we've seen so many cars break down on the way to the grid or in the warm-up that we, they're not going to have that opportunity to test the cars out now. So reliability will play a key issue too. Yeah, I mean, in effect, we only have two and a half hours between um, the Saturday practice session and then qualified and when they go out for qualifying that is really your car for the for the Sunday and as you say we do see cars breaking and there are problems and what we don't want is grids that aren't full of cars um, it's a problem because um, for teams that have the money you will take more people and be able to do more things I mean David be an expert on cars that you can change gearboxes in five minutes as you do in rally and we don't want to we want to ensure we don't end up going down that route DC, how do you feel from a safety point of view? Do you think your guys are going to have less chance to be sure you've got the strongest possible car? Well, we've, we've seen in the past a car that's been well prepared and then put to bed for the night. You come in in the morning and you have a fluid leak that's come from you're not quite sure where. So I don't see how just because we change the, the actual running that we're allowed to do that those 
faults are going to disappear. So I think inevitably you're going to see grids with cars missing from that slot because something's gone wrong overnight. And although that may be difficult for the public to understand, how could a Grand Prix car you know, develop a problem overnight? It's just that they are specifically designed to do 65 Grand Prix racing laps and not much more. So you don't carry any excess that you would have in your normal road car. David, do you think this will significantly reduce costs? Um, <clears throat> not in the short term. The reality is our budgets were all well set for this year and, and motor racing tends to be a case of uh, you allocate the budget to the task and then it's how effectively you spend the money. Um, further down the line, I think it can do and I think that's the critical issue for some of the smaller teams that two or three years out we can still have teams surviving on modest budgets and we don't have this continual escalation and this sort of complete divide between the haves and the haves nots. And is it dumbing down the sport? Is it making it more dangerous? Not well, I, I don't think so personally. It, we all talk about change and we adapt to change very quickly. I bet you we're sitting in this very studio a year from now saying how great it all was and we've forgotten all the problems that we faced in the short term. I remember they, when the fueling was uh, brought in, when refueling was brought in, everyone said this completely changes the face of Grand Prix racing. But I bet you if you ask your audience out there, they, mm. they think that changed it for the positive, actually. Well, Alan, it, it is all about the audience out there and is about their enjoyment. And, and last year, the product wasn't good enough. Do you think this will significantly improve the product? I think it won't necessarily change the winners and losers. But what I think will happen is that there's going to be the oddball situation, especially with this qualifying, uh, one lap qualifying on Sunday, uh, that you have got maybe one of the top runners not getting it quite right with the strategy and starting off maybe 8th, 10th on the grid and having to fight their way through. And that's the area that's going to create the excitement, the overtaking, because at the end of the day, that's what we love. Mm. And if we love it, that's what uh, the fans love. What about this new T-car regulation? It seems that fundamentally you don't have a spare car through the weekend and to, and unless in very specific circumstances that are a little bit murky to understand. David, will that change the way you drive your car? No, it won't change at all the way I drive my car because you, you have to be getting 100% from the vehicle at all times. You know, if you're, if you're trying to set your car up to qualify, then to drive at 99%, then you know, this sort of safety margin that you, people might imagine you leave, um, I, I just don't think exists. You have to, you have to give 100%. And reality is, if you now, if we needed, needed to change, if we damaged the car, then you could actually have that chassis re-scrutineered, but you just can't jump into it during qualifying. Mike, what about the refueling? of the car, what's that going to mean where, where you can't put anything in the car um, well, after the start of qualifying effectively? Well obviously last year we used to qualify with the minimum fuel in the car that uh, you could get away with to do the, the one time lap. Now you can't refuel before the race so you're going to have to carry the fuel that you think you're going to need for the first stint in the race. You go to several races where you know it's going to be a one stop race, you know the tyres are going to last so you want to carry the maximum fuel possible. And one of last year's problems, if you've got the quickest car on pole and he's, got, he's full up with fuel and he's on the best strategy, he's probably going to win. Now you may well have the situation where someone's chosen to, say, do two or three stops, um, will qualify significantly quicker. It's the question of whether that, that strategy is going to work. Mm. And, uh, of course, if condition changes, who knows? But I think the great thing is you may well have the quickest car on the right strategy, but 10th or 12th on the grid. So, David Richards, are we going to see a Minardi on pole position, do you think? <laughs> well, you know, there, there will be events, and clearly people will look at this tactically and sort of say, well, come to Monaco and uh, let's just lead for the first two laps and sort of put it on pole. But uh, I think this is, all adds to the sort of spice of the yeah. sport, and I think, uh, I think you'll see the audience uh, revel in this. It means, Alan McNish, you're going to be uh, quicker on a Friday than, than the fellows <coughs> on a Saturday, doesn't it? Well, yeah, you're always trying to be quick every single time and you want to be the fastest, but uh, I do think that... As we said before, it is going to spice up that qualifying, yeah. but it's going to spice the whole race weekend up because you're interested to see who's quick on Friday and then it leads directly into Saturday and Sunday. Sure. And just final word from you, David, uh, it is going to make the sport very unpredictable. It certainly will, but I think that people will become uh, bored very quickly of, of not actually being able to follow what's happening until you get to the last 20 laps or 30 laps of the Grand Prix when, when the refuelling side of things has, has actually you know, worked itself out. And I disagree with Dave where he says that, um, that when they brought in refuelling that that actually made it a little bit more exciting. I actually think that racing was better when you had no refuelling because you knew you were on the same strategy as the car in front. Now you, you, you're going to have a car in front of you which is inherently quicker because there's less fuel on. You can't overtake the, the car, but if you're all out there with the same level of fuel then you know you have to get by that car because you might not be making a pit stop. I think you look at it purely from a driver's point of view. I think you must put your 
And I think the sport must put itself in the eyes of the fans more and really look what they're looking for. Well, uh, I think that at the end of the day it is racing and what the fans want to see is racing on the track. And to have to sit there and try and work out as an armchair enthusiast what the strategies are and what the teams have decided, it's just too confusing for, for anyone at home. My father's been following motorsport for years and years and he can't follow <laughs> all the strategies. So I think that uh, it's fine to say put it, you know, that it's in the interest of, of having the public be able to, to watch good racing. Um, but uh, good racing is what happens on the track, not what happens on the pit wall you know, with team principals and engineers. But okay. I think we, we have to accept that one of the problems was when you sat and looked at the grid on a Saturday last year, you knew who was going to win yeah. within the, the odd one or two people yeah. um, because people would be predominantly on one strategy and you knew what it was going to be. Now there is going to be the uncertainty as people watch the opening laps. They're not going to know, and maybe that's what Formula One needs. I think we'll we leave. might not going to know either. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, who know knows? We've got it wrong. <laughs> we will leave it there for the moment, gentlemen. Plenty more from uh, all of you later on. Of course, we are previewing the Formula One season. It blasts off the grid at uh, Albert Park in Melbourne next weekend. We have 10 teams, 20 drivers, one or two transfers, including Jensen, Jensen Button's move to BAR. Sprinkling of new faces as well, but for Ferrari, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Champion team and favourite to stay that way, Ferrari had better buy a new trophy cabinet. It's another season with their most successful lineup ever. Michael Schumacher and wingman Rubens Barrichello. Williams BMW wants much more than their solitary win in Malaysia last year and they lead the chasing pack. Chasing each other, a Colombian bad boy, Juan Pablo Montoya and proven race winner, Ralph Schumacher. A win in Monaco, the only highlight of a dark season for McLaren, David Coulthard leads the team into another campaign. Alongside David, he's small on talk, big on talent, Kimi Raikkonen. Not only are Sauber's drivers both German, but they're from the same small town. People of Mönchengladbach stand up for your favourite sons, Nick Heidfeld and Heinz Harold Frensen. Renault are next, a French team based in England with a Spaniard and an Italian for drivers. Jano Trulli partners Fernando Alonso, who graduates from the Renault test team. Jordan renew old ties with engine suppliers Ford this year. Hopes rest on the shoulders of Italian Giancarlo Fisichella and fresh from Japan, it's Norfolk's Ralph Furman Jr. Keeping it real in British racing green is Jaguar Cosworth. They take on ex-Williams test driver Antonio Pizzonia and Aussie Mark Webber from Minardi. Talking of Minardi, they field our fourth Brit on the grid, Sheffield's Justin Wilson. And back after a year off, it's Jos the boss for Schnappen. Toyota, they're well-funded, have a good engine, an improving chassis and could spring a surprise or two. Frenchman Olivier Panis and reigning kart champion Cristiano De Matta are the men to do it. And finally, BAR Honda. There's an air of creative tension between drivers Jacques Villeneuve, who's been there since day one, and new boy Jensen Button. This should be one to watch. There's a strong sense of optimism at BAR this year. The new car is a massive improvement over last year's and although it's been fragile in testing, the speed is clearly there. This is great news for Jensen Button, who's trying to establish himself after the disappointment of Renault. I know how I've improved over the last few years. They might not have been the best years in, in, uh, in Formula One, um, especially the, the first year at Benetton. But I've, I've gained a lot of experience. Um, you do definitely mature over a few years in Formula One. I have my own opinion now about things and uh, I'm driving wise, fitness wise, technically it's, I'm the best I ever have been in Formula 1. The tabloids are making a great deal at the moment of the potential spat between you and Jack, claims you don't really get along with each other. Is too much being made of that? You know, it's the start of the season, we're both working very hard, um, we don't go and play cards in the evening, um, but we get on, you know, we, we, we say, uh, say hello in the morning. When I leave, I say goodbye to everyone, as you should do. I mean, there's no reason why, why we can't work together, uh, meaning sharing data and 
and giving as much input as we can, not trying to keep anything back. So we need to do that really. So. You've always worked alongside really quick drivers in Formula One, Fisichella, Trulli, Ralph Schumacher, but now you're alongside a, a proven race winner and a world champion. What difference does that make? What's that going to bring out of you? I've never actually been a teammate of anyone that's won a race. I mean, Ralph's won races now, but uh, yeah, but they've always been very, very quick drivers. Obviously, that's that's normal in Formula One. I think Jacques is. I think he's going to be quick. There's no reason why he wouldn't be. He's been world champion in the past, and if you look at his qualifying stats from last year, he's he did a very good job. Um, we're never going to know how how quick either of us are until we get to, to the first race, really. So uh, let's wait and see. Villeneuve has made it clear he has yet to develop any respect for Button. He feels he's the number one at BAR, and he's out to kick Jensen's backside this year. So far, his first three years in Formula One have been highly unimpressive. Uh, so you cannot, it would not be nice to judge him on, on these first seasons. It's probably better to, to forget that he's had three years of F1 and uh, wait and see what he does on this season. David Richards, they're your two drivers, highly unimpressive. And Villeneuve also saying that Jensen brings to the sport what the boy bands do to music. Um, how are you going to sort those two out? A lot, a lot of fuss has been made about this, but the reality is you always get these tensions inside teams. I don't know if you've experienced it, David, or Alan has, but it's quite natural as they vibe for position at the start of a season. And uh, I think at the end of the day, everything will sort of unfold in uh, Melbourne next weekend. Just a quick word from Mike Gascoigne. You, you, you've had Jensen for the last couple of years. Uh, which camp are you in, David's or Villeneuve's? Well, <laughs> I mean, Jensen's a very nice guy. He had um, two very quick teammates, but also two very unpolitical teammates who he got on very well and worked well with. That certainly isn't going to be the case uh, this year, so it'll be interesting to see. But, David, uh, talking about teammates, with these qualifying sessions that we have, especially, obviously, uh, on the Saturday afternoon, when, after the running order of Friday, one of your drivers clearly is going to run before the other, so when they come back into the pits, got to download a lot of information. You can help the second driver in your team. And with that sort of atmosphere between your two drivers, and we've seen what happened between Montoya and Ralph Schumacher, I'd be interested to also hear what David uh, DC's got to say about this too. But how are you going to manage that? Do you think there'll be a transfer of information? Or if uh, your first driver comes in, he's going to say, hey, I'm not telling him anything. He'll beat me on the grid. No, I think uh, we will get them working as a team. And that's my role, obviously. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, Jacques a very intelligent person and uh, he's going to realise that there are swings and roundabouts in this relationship and uh, he can benefit as much as, as Jensen can from it. DC, will you expect help from or give help to Kimi Raikkonen? Well, I certainly won't be giving help directly to Kimi, but I'll be giving as much help as I can to the team. And I wouldn't expect him to directly want to help me as a driver. You know, we're trying to beat each other. But I think in being professional, you, you do everything you can to explain the car and leave it to the engineers to interpret. You know, there's obviously engineers who work directly in his car. Two heads are better than one, obviously, and especially now with the reduced rung you're going to get over a weekend if you're not one of the Friday morning testing teams, then the driver's going to have to work together better mm. than ever before, I would have thought. But I think you're working together for the benefits of the car. However, the one thing that uh, I think is that certainly you don't help your teammates in how to drive the car. You know, that's the one area that you do keep to yourself. You know, your lines, the way you're applying the power and that sort of thing. However, a faster car is obviously going to benefit you both and you have to work together to try and achieve it. But surely, Alan, it does help if you're saying more than hello and good night to your teammate, doesn't it? It depends if your teammate is saying more than hello and good night to you. Yes, it does help, there's no question. But um, at the end of it, you're still fighting against them just as much as you're fighting against the other guys on the grid. Mm -hmm. Because to be a world champion, you've got to beat everybody. Mike, a word from you about how Renault have gone in winter testing and just a word about the, the new fellow there, Fernando Alonso. High hopes for him. Yeah, I mean, Fernando's a very quick driver. Um, uh, we saw a couple of years ago when he drove for Minardi. He was very mature, a very likeable young man, and uh, I think he's going to go very well. OK, then, so there we have it then. Uh, Jensen Button, he's only 23 and he prepares for his fourth season. Ralph Furman, well, he gets his chance at the ripe old age of 27. Furman, a new name on the Formula One pages. And there's no going back for him now. You're watching our preview to the new F1 season. We're going to be finding out about the new British drivers on the grid in 2003. Ralph Furman at Jordan and Justin Wilson with Minardi. But now our focus on the front runners and the challenge to close that gap on Ferrari. 
The latest creation from Scuderia Ferrari is this, the F2003 GA. The car carries the initials of the late Gianni Agnelli, boss of Fiat, and shares much of the sophisticated elegance of the great man. But the team expect to start the season with their 2002 car. It's certainly quick, but can Ferrari be sure that it will have the beating of the McLaren or the new Williams? We made some uh, more develops in, 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 all, in all the respects. I mean, um, we have uh, tires, we have uh, electronics, we have engine. We have a little bit of everything, but the car in general, I mean, from the outside, it looks uh, exactly the same. The new rules will advantage teams with drivable, reliable cars. So with a record like Ferrari's, it's hard to see them losing either championship. But no one in this team believes it will be easy. McLaren has uh, made an impressive uh, move forward, together probably with their tyre manufacturer, and uh, therefore I see, as I've said many times, a much more competitive season this year than, than the last year. This interim car from McLaren features significant developments to both chassis and engine, and it's proved very impressive in winter testing. The all-new 2003 package is set to debut in Imola, which will enable the team to better incorporate the new rule changes. Initially the decision was just really give us more time to meet the quantum leap required to catch Ferrari. Now we'll be using the time to understand how we can get a car that can do a single qualifying lap, then not be touched and go into a race. McLaren were found wanting last season, so Adrian Newey's technical team has been significantly strengthened over the winter months. The driver lineup features both youth and experience, and early signs are encouraging that McLaren will make more of the running in 2003. This is a critical season for Williams and BMW. Their target is to win championships in 2004, so they have to start beating Ferrari regularly and soon. Williams are the only top team to begin the year with a brand new car. Early testing was spent ironing out the technical bugs, but hopes are high. Hopefully it doesn't take too much time to get it right because it's such a new radical concept that I think to find the you know, right setups and everything is going to take a bit of time. But i got to say congratulations to everybody in the team. They did a fantastic job. You know, this car is such a big step. It is, looks fantastic. Juan Montoya and Ralph Schumacher remain super quick and have learned from the mistakes of 2002. Ferrari beaters don't bet against it. I think it's possible, it has to be possible. I mean, there shouldn't be any reason why the Italians all of a sudden can build uh, such a good car, which uh, no one else can do. Uh, and I'm sure it will be possible, it's just a matter of time. Well, judging by the way they've gone this winter, I mean, Ralph Schumacher's in dreamland there, isn't he? Well, I hope not. I mean, the hushed word in the paddock motorhomes is that Williams are struggling. I just hope they're sandbagging. We know they haven't got all of their full complement of 2003 pieces on the car yet. But, DC, have you been anywhere near the new Williams on the track? And how's your motor going? Michael seems quite impressed with it. Uh, no, I haven't tested alongside Williams at all. We, we seem to have spent our time flitting between Valencia and Barcelona, and they've been at opposite tracks. And uh, as Alan was just mentioning during the, the ad break there, they seem to have shown quite good form in wet testing. But uh, in the dry so far, as you say, they haven't turned the time. But that is the same as last year. They, they weren't very quick until they got to Melbourne. In your car? It's, it's a quicker car than we, we started Melbourne last year and certainly as we finished uh, Suzuka. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a big enough step to, to challenge Ferrari initially, but the big hope lies obviously in the new car when it's introduced in Europe. David Richards, one of, one of the main points of the new regulations is to improve the show, is to improve the spectacle. Can you see uh, Williams and McLaren getting nearer to Ferrari? I certainly hope so, and uh, there's no shortage of talent in both those teams to do it. But uh, uh, Ferrari have really shown everyone a clean pair of heels for the last couple of years and have every sign of sort of doing it again this year. But let's wait and see. Mm. Mike, you, you've got a new motor as well, haven't you? It, it's, fair, it's fair to point out. But what, just, just tell us the, the, the theory about starting the season with a brand new car or waiting until we all come to Europe? Well, you want to be reliable in the first few races. I mean, at Melbourne last year, how many finishes were there? Six or seven. Um, so there are points to be picked up early on. So taking your old car that you know is going to be reliable can be something to make sure you get some points. It also gives you more development time, so you can spend more time in the wind tunnel, push the car back later and later, and hopefully make a bigger step. Against that, you know, you want a, bit, you want a quicker car as possible from the outset. So we've launched our new car quite early, um, hopefully got it sorted out mechanically, and uh, put some new bits on it just recently at the last test and made quite a big step forward. So hopefully we'll join those big teams as you seem to leave us out of it. Mm, uh, <laughs> you've, I'll take your point on that one, by the way. You've been driving uh, the, the new car. How, how good is it? It feels very, very good. Uh, the chassis gives a 
tremendous amount of feedback and it's actually quite comfortable to drive even in the high speed corners where inherently these cars and tyres are on the limit of the grip and so I get more enjoyment and more feeling out every time that I get into the car but ultimately everyone's going to have to wait until Melbourne to find out how quick everyone's car is. Mm. Mike, presumably now we can hear everybody's radio, they have to be unscrambled. You'll be able to hear in the pits uh, if other teams are struggling in a lot more detail or do you think they'll now have to uh, speak in secret code? Well, we have enough trouble understanding our own radios, <laughs> let alone anyone else <laughs> around the world. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is they will be talking about what's going on. Of course, strategies are fixed as we start, um, but you'll be trying to modify them and obviously you'll be able to monitor them and keep up with what's going on. David, let me put one to you that everybody out there says, uh, who can get closer to Ferrari this season? Is it going to be the runaway again? Well, no one knows. That's why we're here talking about the season yeah. ahead. But the reality is they start the year as the team most likely. And, uh, you know, we finish the year able to qualify in front of the Williams, which we'd struggle to do most of the year. And we, we showed most of the season we were better than them in race performance. So I'd like to think we are the team most likely. But some of the things they've been doing during the winter have been pretty frightening, haven't they? Uh, I haven't watched that particular horror movie. Uh, <laughs> I've been concentrating on my, uh, my testing and development programme. And, uh, you know, as we all say around here, we have to wait until we get to Melbourne. So uh, all the build-up, all the hype, it will all come out in the wash when we do, uh, well, not in qualifying in, in Melbourne, but certainly on Sunday afternoon. Yeah. OK, David, thank you. When we get to Melbourne, 20% of the grid's going to be occupied by British drivers. This season, Ralph Furman is the last one to arrive. He's Giancarlo Fisichella's new colleague at Jordan. Fisichella, a class act, we all know that. Jordan Hope, Furman, is going to be a quick learner. Driving alongside Fisichella is Britain Ralph Furman, who's had little chance to relax since news broke of his elevation to the F1 ranks, throwing him into the glare of the media spotlight. At 27, Furman is older than most F1 rookies, but has enjoyed a highly successful racing career. Six years in Japan led to the Formula Nippon title last season, and like many before him, Furman hopes his Far East experience will lead to more success at the top level. What do you think you, you learn that's different out there to what you will have learned on the, on the European circuit, for example? Well, one, you're a long way from home. You have to take care of yourself. And secondly, the cars are a lot faster and physically it's more demanding than, than the European cars. But also you can change anything on the car and uh, you learn technically a lot more about setting up a race car. And also you work very closely with Bridgestone. Where I see Ralph being... Um, a big advantage to Jordan that he comes with the experience. We don't have to, if you like, start coaching him in that. He is already at a very high level. It's perfect. Life's going to be quite different for you now, isn't it? I think, yeah, things obviously change when you get to Formula One. And looking forward to that. I'm not quite sure how they're going to change, but <laughs> everyone says it's obviously a very different world. It's all a far cry from the days when he used to have to ask for time off from school to go karting. It's fair to say motorsport runs in the family. Mother Angela and father Ralph Furman Sr. are the brains behind racing car manufacturer Van Diemen. Back in the early 80s, they took on young Brazilian Ayrton Senna, who, as well as winning four titles for them, spent time living with the Furman family. With all these racing influences, it's no surprise Ralph Jr. was bitten by the racing bug. It was just a hobby, really, until and 12, 13, 14, and then you started travelling around Europe and it became a bit more professional. Did you win from the start? Yeah, I always won races and that's why I think my parents supported me so much. If I wasn't winning then I'd be doing something else, probably driving tractors on the farm in Norfolk. And that's no joke either. He's very much at home, even on slower machinery. But make no mistake, Furman's focused and EJ expects. He's a pretty astute character. You cannot possibly achieve those kind of le levels of success unless you're superbly talented. Um, I have a promise f for your viewers. I think he will be a big, big surprise. Well, let's hope so. Alan, you were in the same position as, uh, as Ralph uh, last year. Not driving <coughs> tractors, I'm not talking about. <laughs> but um, how tough is that, uh, is that jump into F1? It's very tough for many reasons. One, you're going to circuits that you maybe haven't driven on before. Now with the restricted time on the track, he's going to have to learn very quickly. And everything you do from the start of the season to the end of the season is analysed by so many people like panels like us around about the world. And you have to perform at the top level all the time, as well as learning. 
and he's got a difficult task ahead of him, but Ralph does know how to drive. Martin, um, Norfolk had any other drivers, have they? I can't yeah, remember you any. can't beat a good old Norfolk boy, you know, <laughs> but um, he'll have to get some designer orange twine now to hold his trousers up. Now he's in Formula One, but he deserves his slot, no doubt about it. He deserves a chance in a Grand Prix car, but however hard he thinks it's going to be, it's going to be much harder than that. Do you agree with what uh, Eddie Jordan said there, that he will be a surprise packet this season? I think we have to wait and see. I mean, he's been out in Japan and we haven't seen so much of Ralph. He won a, a tough championship, but, you know, the step up to Formula One is, is so big, as, as Alan found out, as we all found out when we first got there, that, um, we, you know, it's too early to say, mm. really is. David, can you remember uh, when you first moved into F1 that, that one big thing that hit you was totally different? Not really in driving the cars, because I'd been testing for Williams for two years before that, but the biggest thing that was different actually was that uh, a few weeks before, people on the team were telling me what to do, and then you turn up as a Grand Prix driver, and then they ask you, would you mind doing it? Because they're so used to drivers being prima donnas and conditioned to, to not, to, you know, their first answer being no. Um, so I actually don't think it'll be such a big deal from um, driving the cars as such, apart from the fact it's a different car than what he's driven in the past. The ITV F1 website has been full of emails uh, for this show, and we have one uh, for you as well, David. It says, um, will you miss the Grand Prix at Spa uh, this year, and do you think the Belgian Grand Prix will ever come back? I think myself, along with most of the drivers in the grid, are saddened that Spa has been dropped from the, uh, the calendar, because it really was one of the great challenges for a driver. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, Eau Rouge dropped away from being quite as difficult as it was, because it certainly was easier flat, but nonetheless, it's a great challenge, that track. So it is a shame, and I hope it is back on the calendar as soon as possible. Mm. OK, Mike Gascoigne, uh, one for you as well from uh, the ITV F1 website. It comes from <coughs> Neil Duffy from the, uh, the Isle of Man. Mike, do you think the uh, new regulations are going to make it more difficult to design the cars? Not really, because I think designing a quick car, all the elements are still the same. I think now we can't work on them. We certainly wouldn't have designed them the way we've done for this season had we have known what the regulations are going to be. So I think we'll go away and give that some thought. OK, let me just run down a typical Grand Prix weekend for you, a new Grand Prix weekend. This is how it uh, pans out, and we're not expecting any change in the next week or so. Uh, a couple of hours of private testing on a Friday morning um, involving Jaguar, Minardi, Renault, and Jordan, followed by an hour's practice. And in Australia, the world champion Michael Schumacher is going to be first out in the new Friday qualifying session. Saturday, well, that is uh, pretty much unchanged, except for an extra warm-up before qualifying, and very significantly, no warm-up at all on race day before the Grand Prix itself. Mike, I wanted to pick you up on that. You said you wouldn't design the cars the same way now. Had you have known the new regulations, what will you change, presumably, to be make them much more adjustable, yes? Yeah, I mean, obviously, from the length of time we've got, we used to do a lot of rebuilding of the cars every night, uh, which used to take a long time, and we're not allowed to do it. So I think we'd have designed things that we can change quicker um, before that f final Saturday qualifying. In terms of setup changes, you might want to change it, for instance, much more in a pit stop now than you would have done because you would have fine-tuned the car in the warm-up and going to the grid and now we can't do any of that. So that's the ride heights and uh, other sort of dimensions really, other parts of the setup, roll bars and that you can't change or the torsion springs, you know, fundamental parts, but you think you, you want to tweak the car much more, wing settings presumably. Exactly, ride heights, wing settings, those sort of things. David, have you got any misgivings at all about uh, the shape of a Grand Prix weekend? No, I think uh, we've got to let it unfold now and see how it all works. I, uh, you know, it's a level playing field for everyone at the end of the day. It's the same for Ferrari as the same for the back of the grid. So, um, no, I'm relishing the challenge. Mm, OK. Well, I suppose in Grand Prix terms, uh, Ralph Furman is a pretty big lad. And next we're going to hear from the last of the Brit Pack from Justin Wilson. Justin, six foot three. He'd been told he was too tall to drive in Formula One. Not, though, by Minardi, where apparently size doesn't matter. So then we've heard Eddie Jordan saying his new driver, Ralph Furman, will be a surprise packet this season. What, though, can we expect from the other British newcomer, Justin Wilson at Minardi? Justin, the name Justin Wilson and the issue of your, your height seems to sort of follow each other as sure as night follows day. But it almost did mean that you couldn't make it in Formula One, didn't it? Yeah, it came very close and very difficult times, but fortunately it's, it's worked out and... Yeah, Paul Sollard's given me the chance and I want to make the most of it now.
Because that was Hungary last year, wasn't it, when they rested Alex Jung? Yeah. And it was just because you didn't fit into the car. That was the only reason why they, did, they yeah. didn't uh, run you. It was very difficult, that 24 hours, and especially that evening, sat in the hotel on my own, just thinking, it's not going to work. It. You can't give in. Now, most people will know that you bring a budget, you bring money to Minardi, as does your teammate. But your management is actually offering shares in, in Justin Wilson Limited. How does that work? Yeah, it's something that uh, we've been working on for a while and the idea is just getting the public involved. Hopefully whatever people put in, they earn double back over a period which, you know, for me I hope it's not too long and also for them because I know from my own experience following somebody in a race is much more enjoyable than just watching a race when you don't know anybody. In motorsport terms, you've, you've been around a bit, haven't you? You're not like a, a Raikkonen or a Button coming in straight from Formula 3 or Formula Renault. You've kind of been around the block a bit. Do you think that helps? I feel as if it does. Um, obviously, they've done a very good job going straight in with very little experience, but I believe that the experience I have will help me in certain situations. Uh, I've done difficult times in 2000 where you have to do your qualifying is the first time you see the circuit and in some circuits it was the first two laps of qualifying that were the quickest by a big margin so I'm used to that pressure of getting on the pace straight away. Um, just being in those type of situations, learning some of the circuits is all going to make life a little bit easier. Not a lot but a little bit once we get, get to the races. So what would you say your personal targets are for this year? My target is to, to prove myself. Um, I want to go out there and, and show everyone that I can do the job. If I can't, then I guess I'll disappear. But if I can, then hopefully I can stay on in Formula 1 and, and, and prove myself again. So the aim is always to try and, and be the best. He wants to see if he can cut the mustard uh, this season. What do you feel about the British challenge in F1? Well, good news for British motorsport. We've got 20% of the grid in Formula 1 this year. Justin Wilson, another young driver that deserves a chance. I think it's going to be a question of a no-lose situation for him in many ways because Minardi will be expected to be towards the back. He's got a very quick teammate in Jos Verstappen. And I think we could see something quite good from Justin Wilson through the year. David Richards, a lot of attention on your man Jensen. Yeah, no, I, I really think he's, uh, he's had three years of experience in Formula One now. That's sort of quite a considerable amount of races behind him. He's very comfortable in the team. Uh, hopefully we've delivered a good car for him. And uh, I think he can be mixing it at the front this year and uh, giving the likes of David a hard time. Podiums? Well, you know, it, anything can happen this season. There's going to be a lot of unpredictability. And uh, our car's certainly showing all the signs of being competitive. So, uh, yes, I have high hopes. Mm. David, uh, is the uh, World Championship a realistic thought for you this season? Well, that's always the, obviously the, the ultimate goal, and that doesn't change um, just because Ferrari are still looking strong. Uh, if we can have a reliable start with the old car when the new car comes, then hopefully that will bridge that gap. Is, is there a bit of desperation for you to get that world title, or are you quite happy the way things are? Cause, I mean, you're doing not badly in the game, are you? Well, I think I've got nothing to be embarrassed about with my results so far, and, and you know, desperation is something when you don't feel you're in control of a situation. You know, I think I'm ideally placed to, to exploit what McLaren give me, so if they deliver the car, then I'll win races. Mike, what about the, the British quartet um, on the grid? You can sort of sit back and take an almost a dispassionate view, can't you? Yeah, well, it's great to see four British riders and five, because don't forget Alan yeah. will be at, Sorry, uh, Alan. on Friday at Grand Prix weekends. I think, um, obviously, it's an intriguing year for David trying to uh, battle with uh, Ferrari at the front. I think we're all going to be intrigued by how Jensen does against Jacques. And two newcomers, especially Justin, who won the Formula 3000 Championship, really deserves his place, and uh, good to see him there. Quick thought from you, Alan. I'm very much looking forward to the season as a whole with the regulation changes and also to see how everybody that's around this table gets on with those. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new drivers are coming in, going to have a, a good hard time, but uh, they'll certainly enjoy it. That's one thing for sure. Let's hope so. So will all of us. That is absolutely certain. Have we got an email for you, David, uh, before we go? Um, it comes from uh, Rob Gordon up there in Aberdeen. David, are you going to miss um, Eddie Irvine this year? I know we're tight for time, so one liner, <laughs> like a hole in the head. <laughs> <laughs> that much, eh? <laughs> the Christmas cards weren't exchanged, were they? No, definitely not. I wouldn't waste the stamp. <laughs> OK, then. Um, 
Let me just say we've got an extensive array of programming from the Australian Grand Prix. The ITV F1 team is going to be exploring new areas to enhance your enjoyment. We cover that new Friday qualifying session from 2.15 to 4.15. That's on Friday morning British time. Saturday morning we review the new sessions building towards that new one-hit qualifying session. And you can see the qualifying rerun at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. And on race day itself, uh, we'll be all over Albert Park. We have an hour's build-up to the Australian Grand Prix from just before 2 o'clock on the Sunday morning. A rerun of the Grand Prix from 1.30 Sunday lunchtime and highlights just after midnight. Listen, thanks uh, very much to you all, uh, to Martin Brundle, to David Richards, David Coulthard, Mike Gascoigne and Alan Manish. Thanks to you all for taking part on this show and I hope you all have a very successful Grand Prix season. Well, really, Formula One in the winter has taken a very close look at itself and gone for a major overhaul. We hope uh, those changes work out. Of course, none of us round this table know for sure. We will have a much better idea, though, when your normal ITV F1 service resumes in Australia next weekend. We look forward to talking to you all from Melbourne. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. One hit.